Hello everyone. My name is Arul George Karia and I am a faculty at the National Law University, Delhi. The title of this module is Evolution of Competition Regulations in the US and Europe. Through this module, you will have a brief introduction to the historical evolution of antitrust law in the US and also you will have a brief introduction to the historical evolution of community level competition law in Europe. As you can imagine, covering the history or the complete history of the historical evolution of competition regulations in both these jurisdictions in a single presentation is nearly impossible. But the general idea of this module is to give you at least some glances of the diverse growth trajectories of competition regulations in different jurisdictions so that you can learn the subject of competition law from a comparative perspective. I would strongly recommend you to read all the books and articles which are mentioned in quadrant 4 that's a learn more quadrant so that you get a broader understanding of the historical evolution of competition regulations in both the jurisdictions. So the United States of America and Europe are two jurisdictions that have substantially influenced the evolution of competition law in India. So in the first part of the presentation, we will see or we will get an overview of the historical evolution of antitrust law in the US and second part of the presentation will provide you an overview of the historical evolution of community level competition law in Europe. The Sherman Act of 1890 is considered as one of the most significant turning points in the evolution of modern competition law. The Sherman Act was legislated in the context of rapid industrialization in the 19th century. Rapid industrialization resulted in the accumulation of wealth in the hands of many corporations and individuals. The fast developments in corporate organizations provided more opportunities for combinations among competitors to avoid competition in the market. And many combinations under the discourse of trust multiplied swiftly in different important sectors like oil, steel and finance with the aim of curtailing competition. The increasing economic power of trust resulted in widespread fears about the oppression of individuals and general injury to the public. And the Sherman Act was enacted with the aim of breaking up such trust and restoring competition in the market. I must point out here that there were many state level laws already existing in this particular area in the US. But the scope of application of those state level laws were limited to intrastate commerce. And Sherman Act was the first federal level legislation to address the issue. And Sherman Act was legislated under the power vested in the Congress by the US Constitution to regulate interstate commerce. The most important provisions of the Sherman Act are section 192. Section 1 reads as follows, every contract, combination in the form of a trust or otherwise or conspiracy in restraint of trade or commerce among the several states or with foreign nations is declared to be illegal. Every person who shall make any contract or engage in any combination or conspiracy hereby declared to be illegal shall be deemed guilty of a felony and on conviction thereof shall be punished by fine not exceeding $10 million if a corporation or if any other person $350,000 or by imprisonment not exceeding 3 years or by both set punishments in the discretion of the court. Section 2 which is also equally relevant reads as follows. Every person who shall monopolize or attempt to monopolize 
or combine or conspire with any other person or persons to monopolize any part of the trade or commerce among the several states or with foreign nations shall be deemed guilty of a felony and on conviction thereof shall be punished by fine not exceeding 100 million if a corporation or if any other person 1 million or by imprisonment not exceeding 10 years or by both said punishments in the discretion of the court. Standard Oil Company of New Jersey versus United States is one of the early cases decided by the US Supreme Court that clarified the scope and ambit of the Sherman Act of 1890. And I would strongly encourage all of you to read the full text of that judgment. This is one of the cases that can clearly illustrate the historical context of the Sherman Act. If you look at the facts of the case, you can see that the defendants in this case had formed a trust and entered into different anti-competitive agreements to fix the price of crude oil, refined oil and various other petroleum products. They also limited the production and distribution of those products to increase their profits. In this particular case, the court introduced the use of rule of reason approach for interpreting the provisions of the Sherman Act. The court also made the clarification that Sherman Act prohibits only contracts and combinations that amount to unreasonable or undue restraints of trade. The court, based on extensive analysis of the facts of the case and the relevant legal provisions, ruled that the defendants in the case had imposed unreasonable and undue restraints on trade in petroleum and related products and thereby violated the provisions of the Sherman Act. In 1914, the US Congress enacted the Clayton Act and also the Federal Trade Commission Act to overcome some of the shortcomings in the Sherman Act. It was also aimed to bring more clarity on the specific business actions covered by the antitrust laws. The Clayton Act specifically addressed issues like price discrimination, tying and exclusive dealing contracts. The Clayton Act also regulated mergers and acquisitions that may affect competition or tend to create monopolies in any segment. Private right of action was allowed and the recovery of threefold the damage she or he has sustained was also allowed along with the costs and attorney's fees. The Federal Trade Commission Act on the other hand is remarkable for introducing a consumer protection perspective to the competition laws. The Federal Trade Commission Act established the Federal Trade Commission which aims at protecting consumers from unfair, deceptive or fraudulent practices. The Federal Trade Commission is envisaged as a bipartisan federal agency. It is headed by five commissioners who are nominated by the President of the United States. It can order investigations against corporations or persons who are suspected to be engaging in unfair, deceptive or fraudulent trade practices which are against the provisions of the Federal Trade Commission Act. There were further amendments to the Clayton Act in 1936 and 1950. The 1936 amendment through the robinson patman Act is an important amendment which is particularly relevant in the present Indian context. It prohibited certain forms of price discrimination. And if you look at the history of this particular amendment, you can see that it was intended to protect small-scale retailers who were facing considerable threat to their existence from large-scale chain stores who were receiving highly discounted prices for their goods due to their bigger procurements. This is also the reason why I mentioned earlier that this is an amendment 
which is of substantial importance for the present Indian context because at the moment we are also seeing similar practices in India. The Robinson Patman Act made it unlawful to discriminate in prices between different purchasers of commodities like grade and like grade and quality where such commodities are sold for use consumption or resale and where it may substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly or injure destroy or prevent competition Morton Salt versus FTC is one of the landmark cases from the US Supreme Court that addressed in detail the scope and ambit of the Robinson Patman Act and I would again strongly recommend all of you to read the full text of this particular judgment if you really want to learn antitrust law in the US. In this case the respondent was engaged in the manufacture of different brands of table salt. One of their brands blue label was sold to customers on a quantitative based One of their brands, Blue Label was sold to customers on a quantity based discount system and the prices were as seen in the table you can see in this slide. Only five companies who were operating large scale retail stores managed to procure table salt at $1.35 and they were able to sell the product to consumers at much lesser price when compared to other retailers. The respondent used different quantity discount systems in other brands also. In those cases, carload purchasers enjoyed better discounts as compared to less than carload purchasers. Those purchasing above $50,000 worth of all brands of salt within a period of 12 months also benefited from nearly 10% discount. While the offered discounts could theoretically have been availed by anyone, practically it resulted in price discrimination between large scale retailers and small scale retailers. The Federal Commission held that these price discriminations were in violation of Section 2 of the Clayton Act as amended by the Robinson Patman Act. But the Appellate Court set aside the commission's findings and order. Ultimately, the matter reached the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court granted certiorari. In this case, the Supreme Court held that the Robinson Patman Act does not require that the discriminations must in fact have harmed competition, but only that there is a reasonable possibility that they may have such an effect. The court also agreed with the findings of the FTC that the competitive opportunities of certain merchants were injured when they had to pay the respondent substantially more for their goods than what their competitors had to pay. The court also made the clarification that the burden of proof is upon the seller to prove that its quantity based differentials were justified by cost savings. According to the court, the commission need to only prove that a seller had charged one purchaser a higher price for like goods than one he had charged one or more of the purchaser's competitors. In the year 1950, Seller Kefovo Act was enacted to address some of the loopholes in the anti-merger provisions with regard to asset acquisitions. Under the original version of section 7 of the Clayton Act 1914, even though the acquisition of stocks of one corporation by a competitor was prohibited, it had not explicitly included the acquisition of assets and many corporations were misusing this loophole. This amendment act addressed this issue by amending Section 7 of the Clayton Act and it explicitly included assets within the ambit of Section 7 of the Clayton Act. 
The Hart Scott Rodino Antitrust Improvements Act of 1976 also needs to be briefly mentioned here. This legislation is noted for making some substantial changes in the federal antitrust laws. HSR Act, as it is commonly called, insisted on mandatory filings before the US Federal Trade Commission and Department of Justice for completing certain mergers, acquisitions and transfers of securities or assets so that FTC and DOJ could ensure that those transactions will not violate the antitrust laws or adversely affect competition in the market. The primary factor that necessitated the formulation of these pre-merger notification was that substantial costs are involved to restore competition in any market after the completion of an anti-competitive merger. Before we end the discussion on the evolution of antitrust laws in the US, I must also add that the case laws that have come up over the years have played a very important role in the interpretation of antitrust laws in the US. Judicial interpretation of the antitrust provisions over the years have brought in many radical changes in how the whole antitrust laws are perceived. You should find the latest available case laws if we have to determine the current interpretation of any legal provision within the realm of antitrust law. Now let us have a quick glance through the evolution of community level competition law in Europe. As many of you might already be knowing, competition within Europe is regulated at two levels. One at the national level and second at the community level. The national level regulations govern matters whose effects are limited to the territories of those member states. European community level regulations on the other hand looks at matters affecting trade between member states. And as we could see from practice, many of the contemporary commercial transactions are subject to scrutiny of both national regulations as well as community level regulations. The focus point in this brief overview will be the European community level regulations. The treaty establishing the European Coal and Steel Community, which is also known as ECSC Treaty or Paris Treaty, is considered as one of the founding blocks of modern European competition law. It was signed in the year 1951 and it was signed by France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg. It helped in the creation of a new economic community in Europe. There are diverse political and historical reasons behind the enactment of this treaty. But the two most important ones are one, ensuring equal access to essential production inputs like coal and steel for all those European countries and thereby also diminish the power of Germany. Secondly, the changing perspectives regarding the benefits of free competition also contributed to the enactment of this treaty. Some scholars also tend to view that the success of the US economy, which was extensively relying on strong antitrust rules for bringing more efficiency to the market, might have influenced the European lawmakers for community level competition regulations. Some also suggest that the goal of strengthening the solidarity between France and Germany and thereby paving way for better European integration might have influenced the political decision making process in this regard. The ECSA treaty established four major institutions for the community. They are the High Authority, Common Assembly, Special Council, and Court of Justice. 
The ECC treaty in particular dealt with three issues that are commonly addressed in most of the modern competition laws we see now. They are anti-competitive agreements, concentrations and the abuse of dominant positions. Article 65 of the ECC treaty prohibited anti-competitive agreements between undertakings that tend to directly or indirectly prevent, restrict or distort normal competition within the market. The provision particularly highlighted the agreements with regard to fixing or determination of prices, restrictions or control on production, technical development or investment, and agreements to share markets, product, customers or sources of supply. The treaty considered all such agreements and decisions as automatically void. However, the treaty allowed the high authority to exempt certain specific specialization agreements and joint buying or joint selling in respect of particular products under specific circumstances. This includes the cases wherein the high authority finds that such specialization or such joint buying or selling provided for substantial improvement in the production or distribution of products. The ECC treaty also dealt with the abuse of a dominant position. The treaty allowed the high authority to interfere in instances wherein the public or private enterprises have acquired a dominant position that protects them from effective competition a substantial part of the common market and where they use such position for the purposes contrary to those of the treaty. The ECC treaty also dealt with concentrations and mergers and it mandated that any transaction which would have in itself the direct or indirect effect of bringing about a concentration within the territories should have a prior authorization of the high authority. The treaty also clarified that this obligation shall be effective irrespective of whether or not the operation in question is carried out by a person or an enterprise or group of persons or enterprises or whether it concerns a single product or different products or whether it is affected by merger, acquisition of shares or assets, loan, contract or any other means of control. The authorization from the high authority depended on the analysis of whether the transaction will result in giving power to the entities to control prices, restrain production or distribution, impair the maintenance of effective competition in a substantial part of the market for such products and whether it will create an artificially privileged position involving a material advantage in access to supplies or markets. The ECC treaty was amended by different treaties and the treaty finally expired in July 2000. The ECC treaty was followed by another attempt to create a European defense community, but this effort did not materialize. However, the dialogues for more economic integration continued at different levels and a committee was appointed in the year 1956 to prepare a report on the formation of a European common market. In April 1956, the committee produced two drafts recommending the creation of a general common market and an atomic energy community respectively. And this paved way for the establishment of the treaty establishing the European economic community. This treaty was signed at Rome in 1957 by all the original six member states which are France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg. The EEC treaty which is also known as Rome treaty aimed at the creation of a common market, a customs union and common policies. The objectives of the treaty 
were to be carried out with the help of four major institutions. They are the Assembly, the Council, the Commission and the Court of Justice. While the European Parliament had an advisory role, the Council was envisaged to prepare the standards and the Commission was envisaged to draft the proposals. The EEC Treaty consisted of 240 articles. The most important competition related provisions in the treaty were articles 85 and 86. Article 85 dealt with anti-competitive agreements which are likely to affect trade between the member states and which have as their object or result the prevention, restriction or distortion of competition within the common market. Some of the acts specifically outlawed under this provision include direct or indirect fixing of prices or any other trading conditions, limitations or control of production, markets, technical development or investment, market sharing or sharing of resources of supply and the application to parties to transactions of unequal terms in respect of equivalent supplies, thereby placing them at a competitive disadvantage. The EEC treaty also clarified that all such anti-competitive agreements and decisions shall be null and void. However, it is important to note that the treaty exempted from the prohibition those agreements and concerted decisions which contribute to the improvement of production or distribution of goods or the promotion of technical or economic progress while reserving to users an equitable share in the profit resulting therefrom. Those agreements were also required not to impose on the enterprises concerned any restrictions not indispensable to the attainment of the above objectives and there should not also be such enterprises to eliminate competition in respect of a substantial proportion of the goods concerned. Article 86 of the treaty prohibited the abuse of dominant position. Some of the practices specifically prohibited under the provision include direct or indirect imposition of any inequitable purchase or selling prices or of any other inequitable trading conditions, limitations of production, markets or technical development to the prejudice of the consumers, application to parties to transactions of unequal terms in respect of equivalent supplies, thereby placing them at a competitive disadvantage, and subjecting of the conclusion of a contract to the acceptance by a party of additional supplies which either by their nature or according to their commercial usage have no connection with the subject of such contract. The EEC treaty also addresses the issue of extent of support that can be given for public enterprises and the treaty also outlawed state aids that can distort competition except those specifically allowed under the treaty. One of the important and interesting aspects one may observe from the EEC treaty is the absence of merger regulations and this was due to lack of consensus in this regard among the member states. The EEC treaty was amended by different treaties and one of the most prominent ones in this regard include the treaty on European Union which was signed in 1992. It is also known as TEU or the Maastricht Treaty and this presented the next major step in European integration. This treaty channelized more cooperation in the fields of foreign policy, defense, police and justice together under a single framework, the European Union. It also launched the Economic and Monetary Union and EEC was renamed as European Community. There were further amendments in the community level law and the most important one to be mentioned in the context of our discussion is the Lisbon Treaty which was signed in the year 2007. Apart from engaging in a more democratization process within the community, 
The Lisbon Treaty also tried to better demarcate the powers belonging to the EU and the powers that belong to the member countries. The treaty renamed the Rome Treaty as a treaty for the functioning of the European Union. Article 101 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union deals with anti-competitive agreements. As one may clearly notice from the wordings of the article, one can trace back the roots of this provision to the earlier treaties. As in the case of previous treaties, the general position is that anti-competitive agreements and decisions shall be automatically void unless they fall under the specific exemptions provided under Article 101 Clause 3. Article 102 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union deals with abuse of a dominant position by one or more undertakings. Examples of abuses provided by the provision include directly or indirectly imposing unfair purchase or selling prices or other unfair trading conditions, limiting the production markets or technical development to the prejudice of consumers, applying similar conditions to equivalent transactions with other trading parties and thereby placing them at a competitive disadvantage. Article 107 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union prohibits state aid. According to Article 107, any aid granted by a member state or through state resources in any form which distorts or threatens to distort competition by favoring certain undertakings or the production of certain goods shall insofar as it affects trade between member states be incompatible with the internal market. However, Article 107 also provides certain specific exemptions which includes aid having a social character which are granted to individual consumers provided that such aid is granted without discrimination relating to the origin of the products concerned and also the aid to make good the damage caused by natural disasters or exceptional occurrences. It is important also to mention that sector specific regulations may also have important competition related provisions and this needs to be borne in mind while analyzing the legality of the specific types of conduct in some sectors. The EC merger regulation also needs to be briefly mentioned here. The EC merger regulation and the implementing regulation currently deal with mergers between undertakings that may have a community dimension. The regulation prohibits mergers and acquisitions which would significantly reduce competition in the common market. While the merger regulation provides guidelines for assessing concentrations, the implementation regulation looks at the various procedural aspects like notifications and deadlines. In general, after completing the investigations, the Commission may either clear the merger without any conditions or it may approve the merger with certain conditions. However, in cases wherein no adequate remedies to the competition concerns have been proposed by the merging parties, the Commission may prohibit the merger. Most of the decisions of the Commission are published online and all the decisions of the Commission can be subject to review by the General Court and some of the decisions may even go on appeal to the Court of Justice of the European Union. There have been many landmark decisions from the European Commission, the Court of First Instance and Court of Justice of the European Union on diverse aspects of European competition law and the students of this module are strongly encouraged to go through those case laws to get a broader perspective of the evolution of competition law in Europe. To conclude, I must repeat that the basic objective of this short presentation was to introduce you to the historical evolution of competition regulations in two important jurisdictions. 
as you might have observed from the discussions, the evolution of competition regulations in both jurisdictions were influenced by unique circumstances and diverse incentives. The same is observable if one looks at the history of competition law in India. The diverse historical experiences from the two jurisdictions we discussed in this module have considerably influenced the evolution of competition law in India and hence the students of this course are strongly encouraged to read further on the history of competition regulations in both these jurisdictions. The books and the articles provided as part of this module will facilitate further learning in this regard. Thank you.